introducing our first speaker, Dr. Kelvin Ross. Um, he is a man of many hats, founder and chairman of KJR, co-founder and director of IntelliHQ, director of AI Academy, CTO of Datawi, and co-founder of Young Women Leaders in AI. Kelvin continues to push the envelope on innovation and AI and technology in Queensland and across the country. My name's Kelvin Ross. I'm uh, one of the directors of the newly formed Queensland AI Hub, uh, but also I'm involved in IntelliHQ and Datawi, and I'll, I'll talk about those organisations more a little bit later on. Um, again, uh, my involvement in sort of AI has uh, been a bit of a long journey. I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur and participate in a lot of organisations. Um, so as I mentioned, Director of uh, Queensland AI Hub, Director of IntelliHQ, Founder and Chairman of KJR, uh, Datawi's uh, data platform, and then uh, uh, in addition, I hold a um, associate, uh, an adjunct associate professor role at Griffith University in the Integrated Intelligence Systems uh, group. Um, um, just a bit of background about the AI Hub. Um, newly formed uh, by the, uh, funded by Advanced Queensland, and uh, we've received over five and a half million dollars funding over the next four years. And um, um, that's been set up as an ind industry consortium to grow the industry network. Um, the partners of that are uh, KJR, my, uh, a couple of the groups I'm involved with, as well as uh, Max Kelson and Nine Points. And also we've got uh, uh, strong uh, founding partners through University of Queensland, QUT, KPMG, and many other partners uh, will start to come on board as, as we ramp that up. Okay, the, um, uh, what we're planning to build out in the AI Hub is um, uh, we'll be setting up a 500 square metre um, centre at the precinct there in Fortitude Valley, uh, really as a location for collaboration, innovation projects, and, and how we bring together different uh, aspects of the ecosystem. Um, we're focusing on developing certain areas of, of the industry that are specific to Queensland, where Queensland can achieve global growth. And, and of course, our, our, our key um, KPI for us is to actually grow, grow the skills and capabilities within Queensland. And uh, as we, we uh, grow that AI capability in Queensland, we hope to set up different policy and advisory groups uh, to, to give some advice. Okay, so this talk's really about the um, AI state of practice and, and I'll, I'll progress through the talk. We'll get a bit closer to the healthcare and medical space. And then when I hand over to Brent, um, Brent will talk a lot more specifically about, about AI in healthcare. But just to set the scene for those that aren't that familiar with AI, um, just trying to set what is AI. And AI is a very broad term that's used particularly in the community and, and media to re represent a whole class of technologies now that are advancing. And a big class of those technologies are, is around machine learning. The ability for machines to learn and perform those cognitive functions that are normally performed by, by humans. But behind all this is really a strong data science component. And you'll see that theme come out as I drill more into the area. Um, AI is not new. AI has been around, I think it was first coined in the 50s, but we've seen this sort of wave of AI emerging. Um, um, and so uh, in the late 90s, through the growth of the internet, we, we really saw those companies like Google and Facebook grow, uh, and they built this AI capability right from the ground up. So particularly Google around search, Facebook around personalization and so on. And that was really the first wave of internet enabled companies then progressing into how we used AI and machine learning and more business decisions. And now we're deep in this phase of now um, with deep learning, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment, is how that is now performing a bunch of these perceptive tasks around voice and vision and natural language to perceive the environment that we're operating in. And really now emerging into this new wave is, is how do we achieve autonomy? So we're seeing that most represented in the, uh, um, the autonomous vehicle space with uh, companies like Tesla and Waymo and Uber uh, really looking at pushing the boundaries of AI capability in, in autonomy. So machine learning, as I mentioned, is one of the core aspects of AI. And for me as a software engineer trained um, you know, 30 plus years ago, um, 
you know, we really use this model or specification based approach to building out IT systems. And machine learning represents this transition where the machine itself actually learns those rules that we'd normally handcraft into our source code and into our systems. So instead of that, machine learning instead takes examples through the use of input and output data as examples. And then the algorithms actually decipher the rules as opposed to us as, uh, as humans and as developers hand coding those rules into the code. And then we can apply those systems. So one of the benefits of, of AI and machine learning in this space is, is in many, as systems get more complex and behaviors get more complex, uh, that, that complexity starts outstretching the, our capability as humans to actually define the rules of the way things perform. And uh, so machine learning presents a, a paradigm there to make new insights beyond our human capability. And I think this is evidenced really through the adoption of AI. So in 2012, we saw the, uh, the AlexNet uh, algorithm uh, got published in how it performed on ImageNet. Uh, so that was with um, Jeffrey Hinton and, and that group of uh, AI researchers. Um, so they really used deep learning to then uh, do classification on this uh, image benchmark called ImageNet. And then all of a sudden it was shown that deep learning outperformed pretty much the, the current uh, best practice at that stage. So the previous best practice were feature engineered systems, whereas humans, we would write the features for the recognition. And then we got to this new level of capability. So we'd pretty much got to our maximum capacity. And then not only did AI exceed that, but AI has continued to improve to the point where it now can perform many of those functions beyond human capability. And, uh, um, and really that triggered a whole wave of investment at that point. So since 2012 uh, to today, what we saw in 2014, 2015, 2016, was a massive uptick in investment uh, in AI. So how did that happen? Well, it, it came about, you know, as I said, AI has been around for decades, but, and these algorithms like neural nets had been around since the eighties and so on, but really we didn't have the compute power and the data to really feed enough information into these algorithms for, the, for them to work. And pretty much it was at that point where cloud computing and big data had all converged to the point now where these algorithms can be, can be constructed. And really now it's opened up this new wave of implementation where we can now apply these techniques and vision and voice and other areas um, with a lot of uh, ability. Uh, so so th since that time, you've seen this rapid explosion of, of applications that we can point AI to, to achieve this high level of cognitive function. Uh, so let's just explain how deep learning works briefly. Um, let's say we we're writing an algorithm, we had an app or something, we wanted to determine dog breeds between a chihuahua and a, and a, uh, a Labrador. We would provide lots of examples and we'd have labels like this is a chihuahua. And initially when we set up our deep learning, we're setting up this training mode where initially we probably just randomly set some weights in the neural network. But as we perform the computation, this algorithm might present uh, uh, predict that it's only a 21% chance that it's a, uh, a chihuahua where those random weights uh, said 77% chance that it was a, uh, a Labrador. So obviously those are quite wrong from the ground truth. So then the, the, uh, the, the secret source in, um, in deep learning is then this back propagation that it then takes these weights and, and computes the loss. And then it works out what adjustments to the weights and gradients it needs to make so that next time it sees this image, it's got a closer prediction to the actual prediction. And once we apply that with many examples, we find that these algorithms then tend to converge on, on quite high levels of accuracy in making those predictions. But um, with deep learning, what also comes with that is we have to provide lots of examples. So we do, we have achieved this higher level of accuracy, but we've also had to, uh, um, uh, collect large sets of data because these algorithms don't respond very well to different situations. So we need to give them lots of examples of, of lots of different chihuahuas and lots of different Labradors and so on. Uh, and they easily get confused as well. We can show them examples where all of a sudden the algorithm, when it sees data that it hasn't seen before, it might start seeing insights to where it, uh, it thinks it sees chihuahuas when in fact there's no chihuahuas there. Um, 
So again, you know, as we expand this fun concept out, it becomes quite pertinent when we think of more important examples of a radiology image or something like that. So in our approach, we're dealing with, um, uh, pretty much I've been talking about supervised learning where we're trying to train an algorithm where we're trying to predict a label. Um, there's the, the challenge, as I pointed out, requires a lot of data and a lot of labeling. So there's a lot of growth in other techniques in machine learning as well, looking at more unsupervised where, where we're just trying to find the structure within the data or even reinforcement learning where we're more looking at the downstream decisions. And there's many other approaches in between these as well, like weak, uh, weekly supervised learning, active learning, transfer learning that are trying to come over this problem of large sets of data. But if we can accumulate large sets of data, we can definitely build more powerful models. And, and as I indicated, this growth, particularly out of deep learning, has created this new wave of, of investment. And uh, we can see here that uh, you know, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars of investment, particularly out of the large tech giants. So in Google, we saw this rapid advance of, of applying uh, machine learning and deep learning across a vast range of projects, across speech, translation, image, and so on. Uh, but that's also meant that uh, you know, we've got a lot of power entrenched in these tech titans. So, uh, um, you know, these companies have got the benefit of collecting large amounts of our personal data. And, uh, you know, that creates challenges um, in, in how we manage some of the uh, human rights of like privacy and, and bias and so on. And, uh, and we've also seen large global efforts to, uh, to uh, influence uh, and, and win that AI race, particularly a lot of competition between the US and China. So where does Queensland fit in all of this? Well, for Queensland, we want to try to find those niche areas where we think as Queenslanders, we can complete, uh, compete globally. And so one of those key areas is health and biotech, and, and we'll be cutting over to Brent in a moment to talk more specifically about that area. But in addition, I think there's other strength areas. So, so the Queensland AI Hub is trying to really focus on, on a, you know, a handful of key priority areas where we think we can have a global uh, position. Um, I've probably, I've still got probably, f I've only gone for 12. Um, so I might just try to wrap up over the next few minutes. I'll probably skip a few slides and, uh, and get into Brent. But I guess, you know, trying to where we're coming from is how do we go on this AI journey, particularly in healthcare? How do we learn things from other areas like autonomous vehicles where we might collect lots of data from sensors? We turn those into actions and, and into healthcare and, and particularly looking at how they're, using models in, in that space. Um, um, again, uh, I'll share these slides at the end, but uh, um, you know, if you look at trying to increase AI at scale, um, really around a methodology that, that it, uh, you know, supports collection of data and how we, we transform that. How do we apply that in the medicine? I think we've got the same goal of that, that journey of collecting data creating actions and sort of the goal then is about how do we get people discharged more safely and in a timely manner from hospital and, and basically a healthier population. Um, in healthcare, there's no shortage of data. Um, and uh, so the, the trick with AI and machine learning is how do we take that raw data and turn it into models and insights that would then force, you know, enable decisions to be made about how to to treat a patient and so on. And then we'd measure the outcomes and then that's just a virtuous cycle that the more we do that, the more that data feeds in and, and feeds into other algorithms. So I think uh, just with a couple of the delays, I'm probably running a bit short. I've been cut a bit short in time. So uh, um, Brent, I was going to talk a little bit more about the, um, the investment in the healthcare space, but probably it's just easier to sort of cut over to yeah. you at this stage. Let's cut over and we'll... <clears throat> Can you hear me on this all right? Yes, we can. So hopefully that's still sharing out and you can now see my talk. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Dr. Brent Richards. I'm the Medical Director of Innovation as well as the Director of Critical Care Research at Gold Coast Hospital and Health Service. I'm an intensive care specialist by training and for many years and also Director of Intensive Care and Executive Director of Surgery. Uh, and now working hard to work inside healthcare to open up the opportunities that we can now see in AI uh, and get health to realize and recognize those opportunities and help move it forward from 
that space. And if I get that, I'll just try and adjust the camera yeah, just a bit. That looks all right there. So I want to take you on the journey from algorithm to outcome because part of the purpose of this datathon is for people to actually think past developing an algorithm and thinking how this is going to work to actually help improve patient outcomes, which after all is what we're here for. AI, as you're probably all now aware, is considered the fourth industrial revolution. It's the biggest and fastest moving uh, revolution we've ever seen in this space. And it, healthcare is uniquely positioned in this, and that we've got these big data flows and can make, uh, can leverage the huge amount of computing power that's there as well as the tools. And there's a large talent pool who want to work in this space. And so healthcare is really in a great place to do that. And if you actually look at it, it means that we can transform most of what we are doing in health so that we can deliver even more than what we are currently delivering. And I actually believe that AI is actually the third major A in positive disruption in healthcare. Anesthesia, antibiotics, and now AI. And it couldn't come soon enough for me because at the moment, we're getting to a point where we're drowning in data. So the data is starting to overwhelm us, the data that we're using to manage process, and we're not getting back to the patient. So we've got this rising quantity of patient data that we've actually got to deal with on a daily basis. Because what we actually need is data analysis with using AI-enabled tools, which allow us to get back to our cognitive spaces as clinicians and to work with value-based healthcare for our patient. So this couldn't come quickly enough. Second problem is spending, is that we're at a point that we're starting to reach the limits of what we can spend. And with a view that we may increase spending to up to 50% of um, government spending going into healthcare in the future, the only ways to achieve that is that we go to a 20% GST or we stop some other government services like stopping building schools and roads, or we move to a enabled healthcare. So frankly, this can't come fast enough for me. And this study that was done shows that we've got enormous value in our healthcare data already. So the NHS looked at it and they believe that there was a $5 billion of NHS benefits per annum, as well as close to 5 billion pounds, sorry, of patient benefits uh, could be achieved just by using the data properly. So we're in a unique place to completely change how we do healthcare. So I want to take you through a few examples of where healthcare can benefit from AI. To be frank, I walk around an organization and when you start to know a little bit about AI, you start to realize there's almost no part of the healthcare system that couldn't be touched and improved in terms of quality and quantity by using AI tools. So I'll start with one of my favorite examples, which was the TrueScore, which is a few years old now. So this was using a database of only 13,000 patients where they actually tried to predict the onset of septic shock in critically ill patients and found an error under the curve of about 0.83, but more than 24 hours in advance. So this is preventative critical care. This is actually predicting when patients are going to deteriorate and giving the opportunity to step in and do something about it. Now this for an intensivist is almost critical care nirvana. And you think, well, that's cool, that's on a bit of paper, it's in the background, but then you take it another step. And another group did this as a, a study where they just used it as a single alert. It was nothing more, nothing less than an alert that went to a team to say, please have a look at this patient, we think they're actually going to deteriorate. One alert, one year, only 70 patients in each group, saved 10 lives and about three quarters of a million dollars in bed days. So that's a single rule. And not only that, that when you start using this AI, you can start to uncover new data that we weren't otherwise seeing. So they took similar data from a whole group of patients and showed that rather than looking at our traditional rules for working out which patients were in which groups, they used the K-means cluster analysis. So again, another AI technique and better group the patients in terms of how the patients would progress and in terms of their outcomes than what we had previously. So not only is it helping us with our rules in terms of getting us to better predictions, it's also helping us discover new data. Another one, diabetic retinopathy. 
medicine is full of images. We spend a lot of time looking at people and making diagnosis from images. And diabetic retinopathy is so the back of your eyes go bad when you're diabetic and you eventually go blind if it's not treated properly. Frankly, it's just an image, okay? So therefore you would expect that uh, an AI system would work with this very well. And sure enough, it does. They actually showed that they could get results which were equivalent, in fact, slightly better than humans. Now, does this really matter? Well, the answer is yes. In places like the Gold Coast, where we've actually got good ophthalmology services, we can manage without this, to be frank, but it's, we'd be better off with it. But if you take it to a place like India, where there's one ophthalmologist per 500,000 people, and a third of diabetics go blind before anyone looks in their eyes, then it's got some huge implications. So you provide resources where they don't exist. And again, if you think it's just a study, they took it a little bit further. They did optical coherence tomography, a much fancier test, but this was done by Google. And they actually showed that they could get the AI to read an OCT as good as a Moorfield Hospital retinal specialist. Now, Moorfield Hospital is the number one eye hospital in London. So what this means is that literally you can take an OCT and put it out in Kanamala or Gundawindi and get the equivalent of a retinal specialist opinion for 50 major eye diseases. So these are places you can move with images. And has it moved into production? Well, yes. Okay, this is already working in the US where they did a trial of autonomous AI-based diagnostic systems um, using some fairly standard primary care operators, 900 patients, and they got slightly better than human results, which us humans don't quite want to acknowledge, but that's all right, but slightly better than human results. So this can work in practice. So there's huge opportunities. And so moving into some other places, you can move a little bit further than that. You can discover. So again, in the retinal images, they took a whole group of retinal images and they tried to detect cardiovascular risk factors, which was pretty good. But they found they could predict gender with 97% accuracy. Now, up to that point, most ophthalmologists would tell you there was little, if any, difference in their ability for humans to detect male versus female just wasn't there. And yet the AI could do it. So the AI, again, helped us discover something that we didn't previously know. So let's look at some more images. X-rays. Again, it looks like a fairly straightforward uh, model where you take a chest X-ray. This is again from about two years ago. And it detected pneumonia as good as a Stanford Hospital radiologist. And it even color coded or heat mapped it to tell you where it was. Again, looks useful. But they didn't stop at that. A year later, they looked a little bit further and they went to for 14 different diagnoses. And again, equivalent to a panel of practicing Stanford radiologists. Now, the big part about this is also the time it took to read it. The average time to read 420 chest x-rays for the radiologist was around 240 minutes. And those are fairly speedy radiologists, I might add. For the algorithm, one and a half minutes. So again, we're talking for 14 major diseases on a chest x-ray, equivalent to a tertiary hospital radiologist, which I can then put anywhere in the world. And again, it, is this coming into production? Well, this is not their model, but this is somebody else's model. GE have taken the same thing and already built it into a mobile X-ray so that therefore it can look for a diagnosis called pneumothorax, which is where the air starts, sits it outside of the lung and collapse the lung down. So therefore it can see it immediately on the mobile X-ray. So it can alert the clinicians before the X-ray goes to be read. And again, it can become mobile. So this is a company called Butterfly IQ who've actually attached a very fancy probe to an iPhone and an iPad and will use AI to help you do your ultrasound. So therefore you can take ultrasound to the bedside into relatively untrained hands or you can certainly train up clinicians a lot quicker with this to give you very good results in a very short space of time. And this is now available in Australia. So taking to another area, cardiologist level recognition of, of arrhythmias, again, ECGs are readily available, readily stored, and again, we've got the ability to read the ECGs at least as good as a cardiologist, so probably better than me. So this is the sort of thing that, again, we can bring to the bedside. And if you think an ECG is a bit simple, 
same thing, fully automated echocardiogram interpretation. Again, as good as the echocardiographers in terms of the recognition of a range of chamber measurements around uh, when doing echocardiography. So again, it brings you some very high level specialist services into less trained hands. And so therefore makes a lot more use of the resources that you've got. And not only that, is that you can start to find new data again in the space as well. But this is where they looked at the ECGs and then they looked at what they found on ultrasound and started to, or on echocardiography, and started to compare them. And sure enough, found that um, they could see stuff in the ECGs that weren't otherwise being seen. And they could predict the patients who were going to deteriorate in the next five years from the ECG in a way that was unseen by humans. And again, we've taken the, uh, the ECG itself and looked at the variability in the heart rate and showed that we can see a difference between survivors and non-survivors of head injury by doing some fast Fourier transformation uh, of the RR intervals. Again, this is something that can only be seen on machine learning. We can optimize dosing for drugs. So again, this is using reinforcement learning and where they actually show that you could get better and quicker dosing of heparin, which is a, a drug with a very, very narrow therapeutic window. So that therefore you could assist the clinicians to give you better outcomes for your patients. So therefore that you would end up with better dosing for the drug. Again, we're moving outside of the hospitals, AI augmented screening for air infections. Again, something that we're working on that Again, it's just an image. We've actually got, we can start to look in, in these ears and we can spread out our screening so that we can take something that's actually a major problem for indigenous populations and put it into less and less trained hands and get more screening done because this is a major issue. Another area we're moving in is looking at text mining of GP referrals. We receive 15,000 referrals a month. And again, these are hand sorted. But now that there are off the shelf tools like Amazon Comprehend Medical, which allow you to read the referrals and to categorize them, it looks like we can categorize a large number of these and therefore markedly improve some productivity and get to a point where we can do some almost instantaneous turnaround of these. Another idea, Amazon Alexa is offering NHS health advice. So you can, if you're in the UK, you can ask Alexa for advice off the NHS website. And so there's a lot of good data off there. You can scrape off these websites and start to give you some very competent health advice because these are from known sources. They work very well. It's used for pharmacovigilance. So again, they're using natural language processing to look at a whole lot of data, to look for drug side effects. Again, this is a very laborious human intensive task, which is being completely revolutionized and another step where you start using graph convolutional networks. I think that this is gonna be a major step forward in a lot of what we do in health. But again, looking at polypharmacy side effects, one of the most difficult things to work out where someone's on multiple drugs and where are the side effects coming from? Again, this allows you to personalize it. Again, it's open source. So a lot of opportunity in the graph convolutional space. Robotic home assistants. Again, this is AI attached to a, machine, to a robot, which works very well. We're gonna see a lot more of this. We want people to age at home. And as well as the companion aspects, there's gonna be a lot of patient monitoring associated with it. And you've already got that even now in terms of Wi-Fi based home monitoring. So you can actually monitor people for falls at home and get early detection of that and therefore early alerting. So this allows people to safely age in place at home uh, rather than being worried that they're not actually going to be uh, found if something happens to them. So again, this is all very useful AI. But given the fact that we're on a data song, we want you to take it past the algorithm and we want you to take it to a place where it goes into production. And for that, you need to build a trusted system. So to, to actually improve patient outcomes, you are going to have to build a trusted system. The thing is that patients accept it more than what you would believe. This is from a couple of years ago, but as you see, 40% um, of 40, 50% of patients actually we're happy to accept AI-enabled diagnoses in some first world countries, but as, they, as you got into more third world countries where you had less access to healthcare, people were very accepting. And even in chronic diseases, again, very accepting. 
So I'm getting a little bit of a wind up. So I'll move through this in a little bit, a little bit more detail, a little bit uh, more speed. You've got to do a lot to earn your trust. So you've got to act ethically, minimize bias. But again, if you work in research, you'll find that most of this is fairly straightforward. Simple ethical practice, uh, where you've got good clinical ethics. And if you look at it, you've got the same Hippocratic Oath for AI developers around security, privacy, confidentiality. Why? We've got to deal with bias. There's a lot of bias in the data. And the one line I like from that is that how do you program bias in a machine without even thinking about it? And that's very tongue in cheek, very, very real. There is going to be bias in all of your data. Why? There's 180 known human biases which are already in your data, which is already being collected into your data. So you've got to be aware of the biases in your data. Fortunately, in clinical medicine, we're very used to bias and we're very used to dealing with bias. It's just a matter of recognizing it and working with your clinical groups to work in that space. At a technical level, there's a Google what if tool, which again helps you to go looking for bias in your data and your algorithms and your outcomes. So again, there's technical solutions as well as clinical solutions to make sure we're in that space. You clearly need to build a resilient system. So again, that's going to be built in the cloud, obviously. And given the fact that you're using AI and keeping your AI updated, I really can't see a way past doing this other than building it in the cloud. And therefore, you've got to work very hard on making sure your cybersecurity is very, very tight in the space. Everything you do has got to be validated by research because AI is an amazing tool and it's just another tool that we're bringing to the clinical workspace. Again, this is a very well-developed area in the clinical space to be working in, uh, in research. So again, all of this needs to be working together as a team. And remember that building AI is effectively software as a medical device. And although we're not uh, very well structured in this place, the structure around this is getting better. But again, there are processes we have to follow, but is what we're going to find in AI is that it's going to have to be continuous. So what would normally in research be called phase four research, which is post-marketing surveillance, is going to be a big part of what we do in AI. Whatever we build has to be explainable. Uh, this is going to be really important in terms of patient and clinician expect, uh, acceptability, but again, the technical tools are there and they're there to be used. And we certainly need to build really good user interfaces. And we really haven't explored that very well in healthcare. And if you want a place to work as a researcher, translation of this AI into practice just hasn't started. There's a lot we need to learn. It pulls together all of what I've just quickly covered in terms of translating that research into practice. So the key part for you as the part of this data thon is that AI, as you can see from that, at a clinical and a technical level is very definitely a team sport. There's including user interface, including DBAs. But this is what we're here for. AI democratizes healthcare. It helps to deliver care where care might otherwise not be able to because of human restraints or financial constraints. And so it actually starts to bring the expertise of the tertiary sector to rural, remote, and into third world locations, which is really what we're trying to do. So I won't read out the summary. I'll just leave it sitting up there for you. Uh, and we'll hand it back to Steph, who's our moderator, and we'll open up the chat, hopefully, uh, and yes. we'll go from there. Thank you very much, Brent um, and Kelvin, both excellent talks. Um, so yes, we are going to open up for Q&A now. So feel free to type your questions in the chat um, and we will get them, uh, Kelvin and Brent, to answer your questions. We've got a good bit of amount of time left for people to ask questions. Okay, so I can't really see the... Yeah. Have we got any chat questions that you guys can bring? Yeah, let's have a look at what's going on in the chat. So is there anything in the chat question? So while we're getting started, Kelvin, is the the technical side of getting this done in the cloud, is this something that is still in its infancy or you believe that there's some really great moves to be had that it's actually becoming a lot easier and a lot simpler? Yeah, thanks, Brent. Um, look, I think um, I, I skipped over quite a few slides at the end, which um, I, I think you gave a good overview of what's going on in the space. But one of the challenges, I think, is how do you take that from the lab into production to the bedside? Because that's really where we want it, right? And I think there's a bunch of obstacles there. So I think the cloud's given us a lot of the tool set from a technical level that we can use. You know, certainly it's given us the data storage environments. It's given us the 
the ability to scale up our computing resources. So we don't need to go and buy a million dollars of servers before we even start building the, uh, the data. And I think, um, um, but there's plenty of other barriers, I think, for us to build these systems, right? So uh, you talked about some of the trust and, and sort of explainability issues. But I think for, for people that are coming to the datathon and wanting to work on an idea, you know, some of the steps to take that through to production, you know, what, um, what uh, um, barriers are in place? So the big one comes to mind is getting data. Right? How do we get data from the hospital? But then also, where does the regulation fit in? So where does the FDA fit in in terms of getting your software as a medical device through that process? And that's evolving to AI. Um, I think also having your data from a lot of different places. So I think some of the examples you gave around retinopathy and so on, when they found they moved from say a first world country to the modality that they had to like some areas in the third world country in Asia, you know, the data collection was a bit different. So that caused issues. So, so all of these things that you need to get in mind about how I go from my initial lab concept where I'm getting good results through to something actually in the clinical workflow at the bedside, there's a bunch of steps. And I haven't even talked about the ones about scaling your business and attracting funding, which is another one as well. Yeah, look, and I, I think that the point you make about that uh, retinopathy study that was done in India, 20% of the images were unusable. Uh, and it hadn't actually been properly tested in a workplace and a workflow and internet um, connectivity remained an issue. And when I talked about translation of research into practice and how you get this into practice, that then becomes a key component, is that you need to get the algorithm and move it into the clinical space and then move it to the bedside and then get it to actually work within the workflow. And having worked within one workflow, then you've got to actually see whether it works inside other workflows. Mm. Uh, and we will be looking to teams in the data on to work in that space, to actually at least have considered the concept as to how they're going to put it into a workflow because it, literally clinicians are spending a long time in front of screens and they need to get uh, out from in front of the screens. Now, some of that is that we don't want to keep putting another system and another system and another system in front of them is what we want to do is to integrate these technologies into their current workflows or help to adjust their workflows so that they can actually make use of these without um, without it being yet another system they had to log into. That, that's right. I think if you had that concept that I'm going to have this new app and then the radiologists can copy their images out of their system into that app to do some other process yeah. and then feed the values back in, that's just not going to happen, is it? So yeah. you've got to integrate your system with really? the current workflow and current systems. Yeah. Steph, you got some Fantastic. Questions yeah, we've got some great questions coming up. Um, one from Dion. So question to both, how do you envisage our positioning within Australia and internationally in terms of this Queensland AI hub compared to other hubs? That's a good question. The advantage that Queensland has is that firstly is that it's quite progressive and so it can do it. There's a lot of niche pieces that it can work. I mean, no one can solve everything that there is around AI. And there's a lot of good niches that we can work in. Yeah, mining's obviously an area as an AI hub. Uh, and healthcare is another. We've got a very homogeneous healthcare system. And actually, with a statewide information system, which is Cerner and MetaVision and ICU, we've actually got some significant advantages over some other states. So not only have we got advantages at the back end level, the fact that we've got quite, so in healthcare, a homogeneous space it makes it fairly straightforward to test a lot of the, uh, these algorithms. In fact, I've had discussions with a uh, big hospital group in the US and they were very keen for us to test stuff that we co-developed with them because they felt their system was far more heterogeneous than what ours is. And so therefore they would get a better test. They would know it quicker if uh, we worked as a test bed for them. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, I think adding to Brent, um, you know, Australia's already got that reputation for world-class medical care, right? And so we're well recognised, and particularly in southeast Queensland, we've got a, a great research reputation in the medical and biotech sector internationally. And I think, as you said, the ability to to take the data and our learnings from our strong public health system here in Queensland 
and combine it with that, uh, as well as backed by you know a great education system that can feed in the talent. I think we've got the the right ingredients for that recognition. Yeah, look, I, I would agree. I think that Queensland's a little less encumbered by silos. Uh, people in Queensland tend to work together very well. Uh, the universities work together, the health system works well together, the companies work well together. And I think that collaboration, that team base, which is a critical piece that we need for developing good AI, is actually quite a lot stronger in this state than in other states. So I think there's some major advantages for Queensland um, to move rapidly ahead of the rest of the country in this space just on that collaboration potential alone. Yep. And following on from that, actually, someone has asked what AI is Queensland Health currently or currently being applied in Queensland Health? If you can answer that. So I popped up a few things that we're working on, which is, so it's not in production at this stage, but it's certainly where we're working. Mm -hmm. uh, screening of ears we're working on, screening of GP referrals we're working on, uh, heart rate variability we're working on. Uh, there's some radiology projects that, there's a team online, hopefully, who are going to work on a radiology project in the same space. Uh, the state has got very used to dashboards. So it's got used to the concept of reusing data in the BI space. So it's not a big step from the BI space into the AI space. I think adding to that, though, like there's, it's, it's been limited what has made it to the bedside globally so far, right? There's... We're now seeing that grow through FDA regulation and so on. But uh, really AI has been trying to navigate that whole integration piece. How do we get it in place? And I think the other piece that we've been doing is prepping, how do we get ourselves ready for this wave of, of adopted algorithms? Because we do know that as these algorithms get developed, say at John Hopkins or other places around the world, for us to adopt them, we need to calibrate and sort of transfer, learn and, and validate on our data before we can deploy that, right? So, so I think there's been a lot of laying the groundwork, certainly the investment in digital uh, healthcare systems by the state has been a, a very important part of that. But I think now it's that, that sort of data sharing models is a, a next key piece. And I also think that as a system, not just healthcare, but right through, the agility that's required to do this well is something that we've all got to learn. The speed of development, the speed of deployment, and the fact that you work on continuously improving a product rather than putting a product in that you expect to be perfect from day one. It's a very different way of doing business and it's going to take time for people to adjust to that as a way of doing business. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And um, another question from Julian. Is there a particular preferred or suggested area of healthcare that we'll be looking to apply AI to? And I'm thinking Kelvin might have a good answer to this. Uh, there's certainly an area that Brent and I have been very focused on is that um, you know, collecting data and, and looking at applications more in acute care. Um, but that's just one piece. So I think, uh, um, yeah, and, and the reason we're looking at that is, you know, acute care, we've got a lot of the continuous collection of data. Uh, it's a very um, complete medical record. Um, but but that being said, you know, the application and imaging, I think, is a massive area to be looked at. But even epidemiology, as we're seeing through COVID-19 now, right, the application of AI to contact tracing and, and looking at infection rates and, and risk has got to be part of that yeah. agenda, right? I, the, there's almost no areas in health that wouldn't benefit from AI. Because if you think about two things we do. One, we do a lot of, I'll call it human image processing. Uh, so anything that's an image process is something that's amenable to AI. And the other one is the statement, I would like to predict X, Y, Z. Now we're saying that all the time. I want to know, is this patient gonna get sick? Are they gonna get better with this drug? Are they on a path where they're getting better or are they not getting better? That I want to predict is an every hour statement for a clinician. So there's almost no path of this, uh, no path that we can't explore in this. So, it's almost hard to exclude areas now. Yeah, that's it. And I think um, touching on what Kelvin said, it's, it's all dependent on the data too. And something about acute care is there is a lot of data. So it's a good place to start because you already have that establishment of a lot of data points that you can work with. Yeah. And on the flip side of that though, there's, there's often, you know, those high value business things that are perhaps less clinical and less safety barriers and evidence barriers in place. So, 
how we could apply voice in the ward and how we could apply it for just our operational processes, which would save the system a lot of money. And I think that that's a key differentiator, which you might have picked up in some of my stuff going through, is that the front of house work, which is recognising an X-ray, um, has got enormous benefit and utility. But if you take our, hot, our HHS, it's a $1.6 billion a year business. We've got a very busy back of house. And just about all of those processes have got some upside, which could be AI enabled. So I think that let's not forget uh, that back of house potential uh, in the healthcare space, because in many ways, it is just another business. Mm -hmm. And uh, leading into that good question, um, Gaurav says, is there a roadmap at this stage to show us what does the production line look like from a clinician's perspective for Queensland Health? And then following on that, how can people get involved? So clinicians, I assume. Okay, so how can, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to front. How do clinicians get involved? Well, firstly, sign up to a team uh, because there's a lot of really good AI talent out there looking for clinicians to work with. So you mean and sign up a team for the Datathon? Sign up the team for the Datathon. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff comes back to give me a call uh, and I'll have a chat. In terms of the production roadmap, in many ways it doesn't differ from what it takes to get a new piece of equipment or a new drug into the workplace. The only differential is that the, there's a technical side, there's a technical assurance side, which is where the team and the partnership definitely comes in, uh, which is there, uh, which has its own pathways and does Kelvin's sphere, not mine, uh, but I've got a reasonable understanding. So yes, there's a technical piece, but understand that this is really not much different to what we do to bring a new drug to market, we bring some new equipment to market. It's the same test, retest, test it once it gets into market, work out what your, your targets are, what the foibles of the system are. And keep trying to improve it. Mm -hmm. As a technology person, I hate to admit it, but I think these things have got to be led clinically a lot, right? <laughs> and, and Brent's point about it's a team effort, that's, that's exactly right. And I often say when we go to these data thons, like the intensive care data thon, they probably have about one third data people and two thirds clinical. And, and I say, you know, with AI, I've got a hammer, I just don't know what nut to crack with it. So mm -hmm. I need, you know, the clinical person to say, okay, here's where the problem is is what the solution, how the solution could be applied, but also a lot of that clinical workflow knowledge and the business knowledge sits behind that because there's a lot of uh, financial and power dynamics within the healthcare system, the way that that would need to be adopted. And, and so I feel these things really need to be clinically led more than yeah. technically led. And, look, uh, and from a clinical perspective, there are two ways of looking at it. One is to find a problem worth solving, which is uh, problems that will pop up. But there is another aspect is that when you start to realise what AI can do, you'd have a different lens of what is, what is manageable. So the reading the GP referrals was not necessarily a problem that people thought about um, that was bought as a problem worth fixing. But as soon as you say, well, actually fixing it's a lot easier than it looks, then suddenly it becomes worthwhile. So it is a little bit of a combination between a, a problem, a major problem with fixing now and a moderate problem, but it's really easy to fix with AI. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We'll probably have to leave it there as we're, we're almost out of time, but this was an excellent conversation and thank you both for your presentations. They were really informative. I'm sure we could have listened to you both for a lot longer. Um, and I think it's great what you touched on is, is how can we get started? What's the pathway into really implementing this and its collaboration? It's having both clinicians and people who um, are you know, more technically uh, minded coming together, which is exactly what the Datathon is aiming to do. Um, so apologies, we couldn't answer everyone's questions, but thanks for submitting them. We will aim to get them answered to you by email. Um, otherwise, thanks a lot everyone for joining us. We hope you join us on Wednesday at 12 o'clock. We have another webinar with some excellent speakers. So you can read a bit more about those on the website, the Queensland AI Hub website. Um, and obviously we really hope everyone is good joining us for the Datathon. So registrations are still open. You can register through the website. Um, it's free to participate and we're still looking for more people to join. So we'd be happy for you to join in. 
Um, thank you very much. And um, yes, we will look into people are asking about sharing the presentations. We'll look into sharing those slides. Um, we will have everyone's emails from registering. Um, so again, thank you, Kelvin and Brent and everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you all on Wednesday.